We are in our series entitled Exiles in Babylon. And the title and the theme of our series is from the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we read about this king of Babylon and he invades Israel, he invades Jerusalem. And Jerusalem and Israel, that's where, that's where God's people lived. That's where they were from. So a bad king comes and conquers God's people. And the king orders his men as, they've, as they'd conquered Jerusalem and Israel. And I'm going to read from Daniel 1 here. The king orders his men to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language, them, the, the Jerusalem individuals from Israel, he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. A guy named Daniel and, and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were the best of those that were captured and, and, and indoc- indoctrinated into the Babylonian way of life. They were the cream of the crop. They rose above the crowd. And in our series, we're, we're making the argument that just as these young men were taken from, from one culture, taken from another culture, and indoctrinated into its ways, that we have been too. We're making the argument that we live in a society and a world that has been shaped by the enemy, that we live in Babylon and not Jerusalem. I, I love that we're talking about this. I love that we're talking about this, especially for our community that lives here in Quincy because I think Quincy can lull us into believing that we're not in Babylon. We don't live in New York. We don't live in LA. We don't live in Miami. We don't live in those places that we would say the fabric of society seems to be eroding. Quincy's Jerusalem. It's not Babylon. Well, in this series, we're trying to articulate that that kind of thinking, it's incorrect. That's not true. We want to notice that we are in Babylon. We want to recognize it so we can be intentional about fighting against it. And Daniel and his friends, he fought, they fought against being Babylonianized. Just made that word up. Babylonianized. They refused to be defiled by Babylon. They refused to pray to an idol. They refused, they fought, they fought against the pull, the pull and the demand to become like the culture that they were in. They refused to eat the king's fine food and instead they ate veggies and drank water. And as followers of Jesus, we want to fight against being Babylonianized as well. Specifically, this morning we're going to talk about the subject of children That's what we're going to talk about today. How has the world crept in in regards to our view of children, of kids? Some might ask, well, I mean, what's the big deal? So what if we sprinkle a little Babylon on our kids, what they watch, how they dress, how they act? So what if our children look like those around them as they grow up, some might ask. And here's my warning as we move forward. There's a danger in this, and then a, there's a danger in this, and the result is our children will grow up, go to school, graduate from college, start a career, get married, start a family, climb whatever ladder it is uh, professionally that's in front of them, and, and find one day that their life is empty. I want to read you something that our lead pastor, Brady White, wrote and texted to me. Our biggest concern regarding our children should be that they will buy into the way of Babylon and distract themselves with all its glitter and not realize the growing emptiness inside until it's too late. This is a big deal. This is a huge deal, and it's not just for families with kids. This is for us as a church family. In our, in our time today, we're going to look at how society, how the world, how Babylon asks us to view children. Then we're going to look at how the Bible asks us to view children. I want us to look at how we've allowed Babylon to creep into our, our worldview, how followers of Jesus have let Babylon defile our view of children. And finally, how can we redeem this? How can we eat veggies and water rather than the, rather than the king's fine food when it comes to our kids? And real quick as, as we jump in, if you're thinking, great, I don't have kids, 
I'll just go make some pancakes. Hold off on the pancakes. Because I'm here to tell you that if you're a follower of Jesus, in my opinion, you have children. Matthew 12, 46 through 50 says this. While he, Jesus, was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he, Jesus, replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Families define differently when you become part of God's family. Those of you who have not been blessed with children, you have a role to play in the family of God, and part of that role is with the children within the family of God. So no no making pancakes just yet. The subject of of children is, I mean, it's a huge topic. We could go a thousand different directions. The list of things that we could talk about is very, very long. You know, the list of ways to think about kids, to think about children, how the world has asked us to think, and then how the Bible has asked us to think. We could be here for days, a lot of different directions that we could go in, but I want to jump in in a very specific way. The way that I found helpful, and I I hope that in our time together you will as well, I want to begin by looking at things through children's eyes. My friend Josh Bailey, he sent me these two great comparisons of of kids, kids today and kids in Jesus' time. And I think it's going to help us understand a bit and give us a, a good direction. And I want to read you two narratives, a narrative of a kid today and a narrative of a kid in Jesus' time. Our kid today, the child in today, his name, it's a fictional, it's not a real person, but his name is Brad Johnson. Let me tell you a little bit about Brad. Brad lives in a middle-class Christian home in Quincy, He's 12 years old and has an eight-year-old sister. His dad works as a regional sales rep for Napide, and his mom works part-time teaching preschool. He goes to Quincy Junior High, and his grandparents on his dad's side live in Liberty. And his grandma, grandma on his mom's side moved into an apartment near their home so that Brad could help take, so, so Brad's mom could help take care of her. And we get to ask Brad a few questions. So, um, Brad, how would you describe your family? And here's how Brad answers. Well, my parents are nice, but a little strict. My sister, totally annoying. My mom helps me with my homework, and my dad helps coach my little league team in the spring. Brad, who are your heroes? Huh, I haven't thought about that before. I guess I'd say a few of the baseball players on the Cardinals are pretty cool. What do you want to be when you get older? I'm not sure. I'll probably go to college and have to decide then. But I think I want to be a professional baseball player. What is your family hoping to accomplish this year? Um, I think we want to go on another vacation to Florida, and I heard my mom and dad talk about getting a new car. What do you want to accomplish this year? Brad answers by saying, I hope to be a pitcher on my baseball team this spring and to make more friends at school. I really hope I get a new iPhone for Christmas. Brad, what's your biggest hope? That the Cardinals make it to the World Series and this cute girl at school will notice me. What's your biggest fear? That I won't have any friends at school It will be treated like a nerd by the popular kids. Now, a narrative of of a kid in in Jesus' day. I want to introduce you to Yitzhak, son of Asa from the tribe of Judah. Yitzhak lives in the village of of Tekeo. He has three siblings, two older brothers and one younger sister. His family owns 23 acres of olive trees, 35 acres of wheat, as well as 84 sheep, 14 goats, and the family home in the village. They employ three full-time servants, two who assist in the household, one who manages chores on the land. They employ between two and 20 seasonal employees, depending upon the projects and the weathers and the harvest time. In his family home live all his siblings, including his older brother's wife and their two children, his great aunt and his grandfather, his grandfather who is a widower and village elder representing the family and serving their community. We're going to ask Yitzhak the same questions. Yitzhak, how would you describe your family? He answers this way, we are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the tribe of Judah in the line of Jahab, who led our family in the war against the Greeks 200 years ago. Before the Romans took over, our family owned 200 acres of olive trees, but we have slowly begun to sell our land to pay the heavy taxes put on us by the Romans. 
My father has asked me to learn a new trade for our family in case we lost the rest of our in case we lose the rest of our land. Yitzhak, who are who are your heroes? My biggest hero is, is Jahab. We still have the sword and the shield hanging in our home, and grandfather tells us stories about him and other ancestors of our clan every Sabbath. What do you want to do when you get older? I'm hoping to learn the skill of blacksmithing and to sell my wares and services to help, other, to help keep my family, to help us keep our land and eventually buy more of it back from a Roman centurion. What's your family hoping to accomplish this year? We are hoping to save enough from the harvest and from the sale of the lambs born this year to buy back one of our acres and add on a room to the house for when my second older brother gets married. What would you like to accomplish this year? Yitzhak says, I'm learning ancient Hebrew from our rabbi and hope to honor my family by being able to read the Torah well at my bar mitzvah. My parents will also, have also paid for me to learn some valuable skills from Joseph the blacksmith, and I hope to bring in twice as much this year as last year by repairing equipment for families in our village. What's your biggest hope? That the Messiah would return and bring justice for my family for all the suffering we endure under the Romans. Also that our home and land would be established forever and our descendants will live in peace in the land. What about your biggest fear? That we would be forced to pay even higher taxes and sell the rest of our land and that our family would have to hire ourselves out to other families and then our name would disappear from the families of Israel. It's a little different, right? It's a little different. In reading these two narratives, I want to, I want to use them to help find our path and find our direction this morning. I, I want to use these two, two kids, Brad and Yitzhak, to help us focus on three ways, three ways that I believe Babylon has crept into our way of thinking about children. Three ways that I noticed differences and even similarities between Brad and Yitzhak. I want to look at who we are. I want to look at what we value. And then third, I want to look at where we place our hope. So the first thing, who we are, our heritage. Yitzhak, talk, talk, talk. Yitzhak talked a little bit about this. Turn with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy 4. I know it's going to be on the screen um, for you as well, but it's, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 and 10 to begin with. It says this. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. How on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Harob, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and they may teach their children so. Babylon teaches us that we're that we're to teach our children to dance, to play sports, to make A's, to play instruments, to win scholarships, be kind, to help others, thousands of different things. And these things aren't bad, but that's, that's one of the ways that Babylon creeps in. Babylon creeps in masses, good things, and quietly pushes out prioritizing God. Babylon teaches us to, to label ourselves a certain way. Babylon teaches us to label, us, label ourselves by what we do, by what we know, by our interests, by our activities. Babylon teaches us that we need to label ourselves a certain way. I know this may shock you, but the amount of times that I have labeled myself as a Texan is astronomical. My, my kids pr mispronounce astro astronomical, and they say it's ridiculous. But this is who I am. I'm I, I, I'm a Texan, I'm a Houston Oiler loving, Akeem Olajuwon cheering, Nolan Ryan watching, Willie Nelson, George Strait listening to, breakfast taco, brisket, kolache eating, y'all fixing to saying, Texan. That was pretty fun to write that. Texas Babylon has crept in and gotten a hold of me. It's easy for me to believe I'm an exile, but an exile from Texas. But you have your example as well, I'm sure. I mean, Instagram, all you have to do is hop on Instagram and you can see how you've decided to label yourself because they ask for your bio. And we've come up with all sorts of ways to let the world know who we are. I checked on some of your social media sites and some of them you label yourself as searching for the sublime, hubby, papa, songwriter, living your best life. We wanna label ourselves as a husband, a father, a wife, a mother, a doctor, a teacher, a pastor. I'm a blue devil. 
I'm a Woodard. I'm a whatever your last name is. Or maybe you've decided you're above it all and you can't be labeled. This world has come in and asked us to state who we are. And, and in the Bible, God says to take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. God says to gather, to, gather the people to him that, he may, that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and they may teach their children so. While, while Babylon, while the world that we live in tells us to fill our children with activities and worldly labels, the Bible says we're to remind our children what God has done, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. And to teach our children to fear God, gather the people so that they may learn to fear me and they may teach their children so. Listen, when you decide to follow Jesus, you're adopted into the family of God. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says this, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We are God's people and he is our God. We are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Babylon, this world that we live in, says you are what you eat, where you're from, how many kids you got, where you work. You married, you single. The world asks us to label, our, label ourselves one way. While the Bible asks us and tells us that we're to teach our children first to label, our, label themselves as a house that follows Jesus. If you have been blessed with children, teach your children to label themselves as coming from a home that follows Jesus. And to do that before they say we're a cardinal house or a cub house, before they say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Democrat or a Republican, we're, we're, we're the croc or the why. It means we need to provide for them a home that claims Christ and then teach them to proclaim him. And if you don't have children, if you don't have children, we beg you, help us do this. Help us do this. Help us remind our children of what God has done, of who he is, of his grace, of his love, of his forgiveness. To push back on being Babylonianized, let us remind our children of what God has done for us and for our forefathers, lest we forget God's greatness. And let us teach our children to fear God. And the subject of fear of God, it's not real popular, but without it, we present an incomplete, incomplete picture of God to our children. Here's just a, a smattering of Bible verses about the fear of God. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is, is a fountain of life. The fear of the Lord leads to life. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. Let all the earth fear the Lord. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Psalm 112, if you've got a pen, write this down. Psalm 112 tells us of the blessings that come for those who fear the Lord. The promises are so outstanding. It's, it's almost incredible. Write that down. Psalm 112. Read that with your kids tonight if you have, them, have kids at home. Charles Spurgeon wrote this. The fear of God is the death of every other fear. Like a mighty lion, it chases down all other fears before it. The fear of God isn't scared of, it's bowing to. The fear of God isn't scared of, it's bowing to. And I've heard it said, whatever, whatever has the most value in your life is what you bow down to. Part of teaching our children to value God is to teach our children to fear God. Spurgeon again said this, tell your children of the punishment for sin and warn them of its terror. Be tender, but be true. Babylon made Daniel and his friends change their names. They, they were made to literally label themselves differently. Babylon has told us to label ourselves as well and to remedy that. We teach our children of, of who we are in Christ. 
We remind them of God's great deeds and, and we teach our children to fear God. First is who we are. Second, the second thing I want to look at is what we value. Again, in Deuteronomy, just, if you'll just turn forward to chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 9. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. In these words that I command you shall today, to command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your, ho- in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as, a, as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We should value the children of our church, but not more than we value God himself. This runs in my opinion, this runs right into the face of what most of the world tells us about our kids, about children. I found some quotes on the internet and I, from when we did child dedications last year. The internet says this, the world says this about kids. Our children are our most important assets. Children are the anchors that hold a mother to life. Cherish your children for they are the most important footprints you leave behind. Now, not any of these are bad, but they place our children in a place that they don't belong. They foster a, a hierarchy that isn't biblical, it's, it's Babylonian. Children are prized possessions, but don't allow them to play, take place of God. Babylon says children are our first priority. But Jesus said in Matthew 10, verses 37 and 38, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. God is first in our affections. He is our first priority. Only he belongs in that position. When, when Jesus was asked, what, what's the greatest commandment of all the commandments? Of all the ways that God has told us to live, which is the most important? And when asked this, Jesus quoted from the verse that we just read in Deuteronomy. He said to love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Listen, the most important thing that we can do for our children, one of the most important things that we can do to not be Babylonianized when it comes to kids is to not love them first and foremost, but instead be an example of people who love God as our highest priority. This is incredibly hard. I found it to be incredibly hard to do in our Babylonian world, especially in the community that we live here in Quincy. I have felt this way. I have felt like, hey, we've, I felt like my kids are going to fall behind. If, if, if I don't love them ahead of other things, they're going to fall behind. I felt like they're going to be left out. They're going to be left out and seen as weird if, if, if I prioritize God over them. See if you remember this. I said this one time. Dogs think my human gives me food, water, shelter, and affection. They must be God. Cats think my human gives me food, water, shelter, and affection. I must be God. This can happen with our children too. We don't want them to think that we are God, and we don't want them to think that they are God. Babylon wants them to think both. Love those kids, value those kids, but love and value God more. Who we are, what we value, and then the third thing, where we place our hope. Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15 say this. Then children were brought to him, brought to him, Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Babylon says prioritize prioritize children's happiness. Babylon says prioritize children's safety. Babylon says prioritize children's success. But the Bible, the Bible says prioritize Jesus. Let the little children go to him. Do not hinder them. It's not in happiness, safety, and success that hope is found. Our hope is found in Jesus Christ. 
Our 12-year-old boy, Brad, he hoped the Cardinals would make it to the World Series. Our 12-year-old Yitzhak hoped the Messiah would return. Both are a little selfish. I mean, even Yitzhak wanted, the, Yitzhak wanted the Messiah to return to ease Roman oppression, right? He wanted the Messiah to come to ease his burdens to make life a little easier. 12-year-old boys are going to be 12-year-old boys. But if we're going to say no to king's food and eat veggies like Daniel, if we're going to refuse to bow down to the idols of this world, we teach our children that our hope is found in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not in baseball teams or better economics. We live in Babylon. We have to fight to not let Babylon defile our children and our view of them, how we view them, how we raise them, and how we teach them. We must resolve. We must resolve right here, right now, to teach our children who we are in Christ by reminding them of God's great deeds and teaching them to fear the Lord. We must resolve right here, right now, to teach our children to value God above all else by resolving not to value them above God, to view children in a biblical way, not a Babylonian way. We must resolve right here, right now, to teach our children that our hope, our hope is found in Jesus. We do this by not pointing to the things of this world, but pointing to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we close, I want to give you three practical things, three three practical ways to accomplish this within our faith family. Um, First, I'm going to ask that you give of your time. I'm going to suggest that that, that if you call Life Point Church home, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that you offer up four to six weeks a year to Life Point Kids or Life Point Student Ministry. You have a role to play in the family of God, and part of that role is with the children within the family of God. And you say, I'm not good with kids, I'm, I'm super, super awkward around children. That's perfect. Let our life point children see your not goodness and awkward self. Let them see you color in a picture. Let them see you change a diaper. Let them see you pass out pizza. Let them see you set up a game. Let the role you play play out in the lives of children at life point. And I was reminded we have a great way to do this very thing, to give of ourselves next Sunday to the children of life point as we come back together for our soft reopening. Listen, bringing your kids to church next Sunday, having them here in the gathering with you, asking them to stay seated within their, po- in their pods. This is going to be hard for parents. You want to love children well as a faith family? Come ready to extend grace. Come ready to smile at a child rather than to roll your eyes. Come ready to let children see you do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, counting the children more significant than yourselves. One practical way to push against Babylon is to give of your time to the children of LifePoint. A second way is to pray for our children. A.W. Pink wrote this, the measure of our love for others can largely be determined by the frequency and earnestness of our prayers for them. William White said prayer should be fundamental and not supplemental. Pray daily You want to push against Babylon, pray daily for the children of LifePoint. And the third way, and this is the one that I think that I have found the most impactful in my life, the third way, and I think it's huge, is to work on yourself. I think this is a a huge way for us to push against Babylon creeping into the way we treat, think about children. When my kids were younger, I wanted a a Jesus curriculum that they could follow. I wanted a Jesus class they could take. For you parents out there, the best thing that you can do for your children's faith is to grow your own, is to work on your own faith. For those of you out there without children, the best thing you can do for the children of LifePoint's faith is to grow your own, is to work on your own faith. Charles Spurgeon said it well when he wrote, train up a child in the way that he should go, but be sure you go that way yourself. As you read the Bible, as you pray, as you practice the rhythms of intimacy, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. We don't follow Jesus alone. We follow Jesus as a community. We follow Jesus as a faith family. 
married, single, have kids, don't have kids. Imagine a church that is full of people passionately striving, with, passionately striving to be with, become like, and partner with Jesus on his mission. Can you imagine the children that a church like that will produce? To push against Babylon, give of your time, pray for our children, fan into flame your own passion for Jesus Christ, work on yourself. And as we close, Psalm 127 is written by King Solomon. And he talks about children. Solomon says, children are a, are a heritage. They're a reward. They're a blessing. He also says that they are given to us like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Missionary Jim Elliott put it plainly when he said, what are arrows for but to be pulled back on the bowstring of faith to be launched into God's global battle? Let life point be a be a place that, that doesn't allow Babylon to defile our view of children. Let Life Point be a place where children are loved, challenged, encouraged, and pointed to Jesus Christ. And then let's pull back on the bowstring of faith and launch them into God's global battle for his glory, for his honor, and for his fame.